Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 94, Black Games Matter. Discussing some of the best tabletop games by black designers. I'm Sean, live from Windsor, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. You can join us Wednesday nights, 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. All right. In addition to our main topic of games from black designers, we've also got an RPG review of Mermaid Adventures from Aloy LaSanta. In our week of review, I've got my first thoughts on 878 Vikings, the first play of our gift copy of Fox in the Forest, and a few rounds of Codenames Duet. Then I've got a bit of a talk about Renegade Con Virtual. This was the first online gaming convention that I've taken part of, and I thought it'd be worth sharing my thoughts on seeing an online con for the first time. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we received, comments on our content, maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of in the week previous. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We adore your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, you can send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Uh, you can also hit us up on social media. I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. And I can be found as Dark Elf LX. Well, up first, a rather amusing comment from our increasing immersion on game night using all five senses topic from last month. Mm -hmm. Mike Robinson writes, if you have a Ouija board, you can even use the sixth sense. <laughs> I had to share this one when I read it. I'm like, no, that one's going in the show notes. We got to read that one out loud. Because that night I'm like, oh, Mike, you win the internet today. That was good. Thank you, Mike. All right, next, a question posted on our eminent domain box insert build video. Greg Maloney asks, does it handle sleeved cards? That's been my biggest complaint for a lot of these. Thanks. Well, thanks for asking the question, Craig. Now, I didn't test it myself. I prefer to play unprotected. I almost never use sleeve cards. According to the instructions that came with the insert, and I even double-checked on their website, yes, this box insert is designed to hold sleeved or unsleeved cards. And I got to say, I actually think sleeve cards might be better because one of the, I wouldn't say a complaint, but there's a lot of room left. There's a lot of play where my cards are in there. Not that I think they're going to get damaged or banged around, but like you can feel them shifting when you move the box around. And I have a feeling having sleeve cards would hold them actually a little better, a little tighter. Well, finally, uh, Brianna, uh, Brenna left this comment on our two-player date night game post. Great <laughs> list. My husband and I have been playing Takenoko a lot lately. It works well for just the two of us, but we can also play it with the kids. Starcraft Risk is one we have <laughs> adapted to with just the two of us. We still play with the full mechanics, not the two-player variant. I still prefer it with more people. We're getting Takedo and Suro soon to trial. I think the most frustrating thing with loving board games is learning new games with other people. They tend to get impatient while you're trying to puzzle through the rules mm. and mechanics. Well, thanks, Brenna. Uh, Takenoko is a great game that plays well with two, but I got to say, I like it with more players. Now, StarCraft Risk, I haven't tried, but if you like any version of Risk and you want a two-player version, I strongly recommend the Star Wars Risk. And if you can find it, the Black Series version is a little better. It comes with a, a miniature for the Millennium Falcon and the Death Star and uh, slightly thicker boards and thicker cards. But either edition, if you can find Star Wars Risk, that is great two-player. To me, that is the second best Risk game on the market at all, at, of all time. Risk Legacy being my personal favorite, but that one's not great, two players. Now, Takedo, I do have to say, two player is very different than playing any other player count. Two player, it is extremely cutthroat, and I love it. Like, I think it's great, but if uh, you don't want to bet he butt heads and get frustrated if people take your spot, that one's a little dangerous. Uh, Suro, I, I gotta say, I don't recommend that one with two players. Maybe if you play two dragons each, it might be a bit more interesting, but that plays up to eight people, and it just plays better the more people you have with the best being all eight i don't two player to me it seems like a little little watered down but you did know playing games with your kids so Suro may be a great choice because it is a great game to play with children really simple path building game that i i can't even think of a lower age limit if 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 the the child can trace a path they can play Suro. and and i have to say if, you, if they have two kids 
four is the sweet spot for Takedo for me. I, it's yeah. really, really the kind of if you if you're not looking for that two player cutthroat game, uh, I think as a as a full game with the expansions especially, uh, Takedo really shines at four. Fair. All right. Well, last show during our end of May AMA, we had a question from Roger about Tabletopia versus Tabletop Simulator. Roger heard the episode and got back to us yesterday to say, I just caught your May AMA episode and enjoyed it. Thank you for your kind words and information about board game simulators. Couldn't get your live show because I have joined an online playtesting group in Seattle. Meets <laughs> on Wednesdays. Ooh. As far as Tabletopia goes, anyone with a web browser can be invited to a game as long as a member hosts it. Okay. There might be a player limit. The free membership includes one custom game with <laughs> one setup player three player etc you have to subscribe uh to have more than one mm. you also have to pay another fee to join the premium service i have been moving all my games to tabletop simulator and will keep tabletopia for promotional reasons only. thanks again if you have any more questions about tabletop simulator just let me know oh thanks for getting back to us roger that's appreciated uh, it's a shame you can't join us wednesdays but that's awesome that you found a play testing group online i know it's been something it's something we, we windsor's not big enough i wish it was right like we don't have like a proto to here in windsor or anything like that so it's really cool that you managed to find a group somewhere seattle of all places cool to meet up with now as for tabletopia i just want to note that i thought it was really interesting that renegade con which more about that later um, that I joined in had a partnership with Tabletopia and all of their online board games, all their demos were done using Tabletopia. Now I was able to get a bit of insider info on this and then they noted that the reason they picked it is for what you mentioned. And it's I think what Sean mentioned when we talked about it on the show was the accessibility. It's the fact that you just need a browser. You can play on a Mac, you can play on an Apple, or those the same thing. You can play on a tablet, you can play on an Android, you can play on your PC. You can, I, you could probably even bring it up on the browser on your Xbox. I admit I'd never tried it, but you should be able to, which is really cool. So I I think that's probably the biggest draw. And I think it's it's a good idea to keep your games, Roger, on there for promotional reasons, right? Once you've got them fully developed, that's going to be the easiest way to show them off to more people. Now, as for Renegade Con, I will be getting back to that near the end of the show when we're doing our week in review. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Thanks to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. A few quick announcements before we continue. We keep growing with the support of fans like you, so please, now's the time to make sure you've checked out all of our different formats. Board Game Geek, the podcast, of course, tabletopbellhop.com, YouTube, MeWe, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, everywhere. And currently, I'm checking out Yumi Social, and I'm kind of on the fence so far. For the old G Plus fans, you might want to look at it. It definitely feels familiar and homey but i'm having some problems with some of the uh the old guard who feel they own the site because they were there first so we'll see more i'm i we are there if you're over there search for tabletop bellhop you will find a business page where i have been posting our content just to see if it picks up over there uh, sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox once a week, usually on Wednesdays. I send out an email that recaps all the content we released in the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, unboxings, boxings as I build box inserts. Whatever it is we create, I throw in there. It's the best way to keep track of everything we put out week after week. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com. All right, right now it's, uh, am I going to get the month right today? I think it's June, right? <laughs> I usually jump back and pass. I'm pretty sure it's June. Uh, we are fast approaching our two year podcast anniversary. And you know what? We're going to try to celebrate this year. We want to, we want to throw a bit of a party. We didn't really do that for our one year, but we are still I have very felt very new at our one year anniversary. Whereas I, I want to do some kind of celebrating for this. So we're working on some stuff. Well, our first recording was Thursday, July 26, 2018. And right now, we're planning to celebrate this anniversary on Wednesday, July the 22nd. That's the recording date that's closest to our anniversary date. So at this point, things are just in the early planning stage. We haven't quite decided what we're going to do, but we do want to throw some kind of party. And parties should have presents, right? And I've got at least one publisher, a grand one, that we've worked with on the path, uh, sorry, on, in the past, that's on board with joining in in this celebration. Well, stay tuned here and watch our social media feeds for more information as it gets closer to the date. 
We start Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern here on Twitch. We love people who pop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. If you're here live, remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell with more chat and some content that otherwise only our patrons get. Uh, right now, the big thing people are talking about in the chat room is a giant itch.io bundle that was put out as part of the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, ooh, I don't have it open. I forget the full name. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I closed it. <laughs> yeah, I know. I closed it. I forget the name. I forget the name. Give me a second. But, uh, it is bundle the Bundle for Racial for Justice racial... and Equality. Yes, the, the Bundle for Racial Justice and Equality. This is a bundle of video games and, and uh, tabletop games, RPGs, uh, that cost $5. You get 1,509 items, and I swear that's higher than it was when I just we talked about it in a pre-show. It is raising money for charity. Um, they are at $4,400,000 right now. That money is going to get split 50-50 between the uh, NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund and the Community Bail Fund. This is insane bundle that supports a fantastic cause and that's what we we're talking about is which ones to check out there's some great rpgs in there some really cool looking video games um we were talking to the chat room they've been talking about their favorite games what they bought and things like that so that that has been the topic of conversation today absolutely um uh, and then uh actually an interesting one that just popped up on my uh my feed not in our chat room but uh related to this is a new kind of platform for the RPG community. Apparently there's a lot of people who are a little upset with Roll20 when it comes to more modern RPG. It's mm -hmm. great for the established stuff, right? If you're running DCC, D&D, games that have a huge support factor behind them, then everyone has made character sheets and everything else. But a smaller RPG may not be that support there, and getting a character sheet in there may not be as awesome. Well, Roll, R-O-L-E, a new kind of platform for the RPG community is up right now on Kickstarter. Okay. Uh, and seems to be interesting. I may actually uh, end up putting some support behind it myself, even though I don't really do that much RPG. What I'm seeing of, of it looks interesting. So. Interesting. The other one, too, is Vastal. V-A-S-T-A-L, I think it is. Give me a quick second to check this. Oh, that's not vast. Something vast. Uh, is free while the pandemic is going on, which is another one. Now I know it. They they normally charge. I don't know how much. Um, Vastral V A S T R A L is another virtual tabletop option that is not Roll Twenty or Fantasy Grounds. I just dropped a quick chat. That is one that is out now. It supports Call of Cthulhu, Pathfinder, Vampire, Sacred Lands, Shadow of the Demon Lord, Exalted, Forbidden Lands, and Fantasy Age. So again, you've got mostly your D20 fantasy games, but Call of Cthulhu's on there. So you got the, the percentile system. Right. You got Shadows of the Demon Lord on there. Well, the Vampire D10 dice pool based system is on there. And this one looks really impressive. It, it, it's app based as well as um, web based. And like I said, currently free um, for now. I don't know how long that's going right. gonna to stay. All right. Well, not too much action in our chat room tonight. So. We will uh, we'll be slipping ahead, and uh, we'll check back in with the chat room after our topic. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. Uh, we're everywhere. It's tabletop bellhop, one word. Now, the best way is for questions to come through the website. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Today, we've got some game recommendations because it's not because not enough people are asking. What are some great games by Black Game Design? So with everything that's going on in the world today, I thought it would be a good time to use our platform to help spread the word about some of the amazing black game designers out there. People creating fantastic tabletop gaming content. Now this list is going to feature a mix of board games, card games, and role-playing games. So we're looking at all types of tabletop here. There are many ways to support ongoing efforts in communities. And I know many of us have used financial means to support causes directly already but we can also continue to enjoy some of our hobbies without ignoring the need to keep supporting these activities. 
And mm -hmm. by knowing about and supporting underrepresented populations, we let the market know that they are wanted and needed in the marketplace. All right, first up, I want to highlight Harlem Unbound. This is a 1920s New York City setting book for Call of Cthulhu and or Gumshoe, which is a, a alternate Call of Cthulhu, Trail of Cthulhu uses that system. Harlem Unbound comes from the mind of Chris Spivey, who has done work on other Call of Cthulhu books, Geist, Chill, and City of Mist, along with some other designers that worked with him, including Bob Geist, Sarah E. Hood, Alex Mayo, Neil Raymond, Prince, and Ruth Tillman. Now, to sell this one, instead of give you, give you a, a short spiel, I want to read this from the back of the book, because this made me want to play. New York City in the 1920s. Prohibition is in full swing, and bootleggers are living high. African Americans flee the oppressive South for greener pastures, creating a new culture in Harlem. The music of Fats Waller and Duke Ellington pours out of the city's windows and doorways, and the sidewalks are crowded with women in stylish skirts and silk stockings, and men in white gloves and Chesterfield coats. There's a feeling of possibility in the air like never before. But even in this land of promise, Harlem is a powder keg. While classes and cultures collide, love crafty and horrors lurk beneath the streets, creeping through dark alleys and hidden doorways into the dreamlands. What great old one shattered our reality? Can you hold it together and keep the mythos at bay for one more song? Now, I'm not much of a mystery or Cthulhu gamer, but I got to hear Chris speak last year at Breakout Con. I yeah. thoroughly enjoy his knowledge and on topics uh, all about game and game design. And so that is Harlem Unbound by Chris Spivey, Spivey and others. I think it's Spivey. I think I've got that right. Yep, Spivey. <laughs> Up next, we got Tattoo Stories. Now, during our last episode, I reviewed a new light strategy game from Bicycle Cards called The Alpha. And I noted during that show that The Alpha was part of a second wave of board games released from Bicycle. Now, this is the card game company trying to get into hobby board gaming markets. Well, Tattoo Stories was part of the first wave that was released in 2019, early in 2019. Uh, this game was designed by Eric Slauson, who also worked on Nerd Words and recently published Monstrosity with a draw monster, right? Monstrosity. Now, Tattoo Stories is a drawing party game, but what it does is it mixes the drawing with pitched-based storytelling, where you get a random set of cards that you have to base a tattoo on it, and then you have three minutes to ask the person who drew the cards what they want their tattoo to look like it, and then everyone has to draw that tattoo and explain why they use the word. So it's kind of a mashup of Pictionary and like, but wait, there's more, or Snake Oil, which just sounds really neat. Yeah, I have to say this one looks like a great party game. I know when I first saw it a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about uh, yeah. the bicycle games, my first thought was this is one of those great, you know, 2 a.m. at Extra Life when everyone's already a little giggly to some mm -hmm. degree. Uh, it, it would just add to that and, and really be a, a fun play at that. That is Tattoo Stories by Eric Slauson. All right, back on the RPG side of things, we come to the first role-playing game that I played with my kids back when they were preschoolers. Uh, that game is Mermaid Adventures by Aloy LaSanta. Now, I first discovered Aloy on Facebook when he was promoting a Canadian supplement for his game, Apocalypse Prevention, Inc. Now, since then, he's taken the Mermaid Adventure system and turned that into the PIP system with its own PIP system source book, like a basically a generic rule, rule set. Uh, he's also worked on Geist, Changeling, Camp Myth, and nowadays is probably best known for his AMP series of superhero RPGs. Now, for some more info on Mermaid Adventures, stick around after our main topic, because when we get to the review segment, I will be talking all about it. And it's been talked about many times on previous episodes as well. If you'd like to hear further thoughts on it, that's Mermaid Adventures by Eloy Santa. All right. I have been a Warhammer fan, a uh, Warhammer Old World fan for by Games Workshop since the 80s, pretty much since it came out. Uh, anyone watching live can see the pile of Warhammer and White Dwarf behind me. I am a huge War Warhammer, I would say, fanboy. Now... I love the old world and I love the struggle against chaos. I love the fact that it was the fight when, when to survive another day, knowing you'll never win the war against chaos. There was something about that that always appealed to me. Well, this game 
turns that fight around and has you playing the four gods of chaos. That game is Chaos in the Old World by Eric M. Lang. Now, I probably don't have to introduce Eric M. Lang to you. He's one of the most well-known designers in the gaming industry, and he happens to be probably the best-known black designer. He is probably better known for games other than Chaos in the Old World. It's actually one of his earlier games. It just happens to be my favorite. But you're going to recognize titles like Blood Rage, Rising Sun, and most recently Marvel United. Now, Eric has gone so far that he is now the director of game design at Cool Mini or Not. Now, despite being one of Eric's earliest games, I love Chaos in the Old World, and part of it is the fact it's Warhammer, right? I love Warhammer. But the other thing is this is the first game that I know of, poss possibly the, the ones before it, but had completely asymmetric winning conditions, where every player, each of the four Chaos Gods, was trying to do something different to win the game. They each had different goals that competed with each other, which I thought was fascinating. And while anyone who listens to our show for any amount of time knows, I love my asymmetry. Indeed we do. Uh, so that was a big shout out, Eric M. Lang, but specifically Chaos in the Old World. Yeah. All right, up next, something near future and as the days go on, getting a little closer and closer to home, it seems, and that is Cyberpunk. Now, growing up a gamer, one of my favorite games of all time was Cyberpunk. Now, in particular, I played and owned Cyberpunk 2020, and then some of the spinoffs that came out, right? Cyber Generation, Bubblegum Crisis, and so on, as well as many of the other Artelsorian interlock infusion system games. Now, what I did not realize reading these books um, before the days of the internet was that Mike Pondsmith, the founder of Artelsorian Games and the designer of Cyberpunk, is black. Now, in addition to Cyberpunk, Mike also worked on Castle Falkenstein. Uh, this one really surprised me. The Buck Rogers 25th Century RPG from TSR, a Dragon Ball Z RPG, and a bunch of other books using the fusion system. Now, despite coming out in the late 80s, uh, Cyberpunk's still going strong. It's still there. There is a new edition of the RPG out that's called Cyberpunk Red. And there's a very hyped and hot-looking video game coming out uh, eventually. This one seems to be getting delayed quite a bit. Uh, Cyberpunk has always been one of my favorite genres. And I love the fact that this one's still going, that Artel Sorian is still very active in the industry and in the market. I gotta say, sometimes it feels like we're dancing a bit too close to the wrong parts of cyberpunk in the real world right now, but I do yeah. still love the genre, both for reading and playing. So that is Mike Pondsmith with Cyberpunk, the founding of Artel Sorian. Do you hear some buzzing? Because our next game is Bees. I think that's five E's if you want to look that one up. There'll be a link in our show notes to all these games. Uh, this was published in 2017 by Action Phase Games. Uh, this one was di designed by Marcus Ross and Kara Ryan. Uh, this team also worked together on Discount Salmon, which was published uh, a long time ago in 2013. Now, Bees is a real-time dice-rolling game for two to five players. Players are rolling their dice and using them to beat out their opponent's rolls to claim hive tiles. Basically, in an area control, area majority kind of thing. If my dice beat out your dice, I get to take the tile. You're then going to use that tile to build your own personal hive. Once time runs out, you take a look and add up your scores, seeing whoever has the best hive wins the game. All right, well, as long as it's Bees and not Murder Hornets, we're all good. <laughs> And that's Bees by Marcus Ross and Kara Ryan. All right, up next, we're jumping back to RPGs. You see our, our trend here. We're going back and forth. I got a really unique looking one here that, that is fascinating to me. This is a map-making RPG called Companion's Tale. This is by Laura Simpson uh, with Dev. I apologize for this right now, but Perkayastha. I do apologize, Dev. Uh, Laura also worked on Dialect. Now, Dialect was a multi-award winning, very well-known game about language learning and how languages die. Uh, sh Laura was also featured in the Pound Feminism or Hashtag Feminism, a nano game anthology. Now, Companion's Tale is a GM-less storytelling map-making game where you're playing a hero's companions. So the hero is acting and doing all these things, and you're the companions telling the tales about what the hero did, but whose version of the story is the one that's going to get written down in the annals of history. Now, this was nominated for the 2019 Emmy for Best Game. Note, Best Game. That's huge. Absolutely. I don't know if this game is necessarily in my wheelhouse, but just reading through the Kickstarter has gotten me to keep up the uh, episode of One Shot that featured it 
to learn more about Companions by Laurie Simpson and Dev Perkyasa. I apologize, Dev. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> Perkyasa is about as close as I can see. I think Sean did a better job than I did there. All right, up next is a game that was brought to my attention through the Black Lives Matter movement that's still going strong across the world right now, and that is Rap Gods by Omari Akil, who is the co-founder and lead designer for Board Game Brothers. In addition to Rap Gods, he also worked on Oh My Gourds last year. Rap Gods puts you in the role of an up-and-coming hip-hop artist just starting down their path to greatness. You outperform your opponents and collect the most plaques by taking over cities, hitting career milestones, as well as starting beef with the other rappers. Good luck getting a hard copy of this game right now. As though, as far as I can see, they sold out every copy available, uh, definitely in North America, uh, through fundraising efforts. Uh, and drain their physical supplies. But, good news, the game has been ported to Tabletopia. Oh. So, you can check it out there. That's Rap Gods by Omari Akil. All right, up next, I want to talk about Edrigor. This is a fantasy RPG inspired by the mythology and lore of native tribal peoples from across the world, with a specific focus on the Lakota folklore. It was designed by Alan Turner. Alan has also worked on a number of other games, including Exalted, Vampire the Masquerade, Mythic D6, and Scion. Edrigor uses the popular Fate 3.0 system, and what really caught my eye about this system is that it is a fantasy game that is based on Native American tropes versus your standard European mythology we normally see in fantasy RPGs. Something completely and totally different from your usual orcs, dwarves, and elves. Yeah, and that's Edrigor by Alan Turner. All right, I want to leave off with something that's coming soon. This isn't quite out there yet, and that's Swords Fall, an Afropunk RPG from Brandon Dixon, which was kickstarted in 2019. Now, this is Brandon's first RPG project, though he is a contributor to the World Building Magazine. Now, here's a blurb from Brandon on what Swords Fall is. Swords Fall isn't just a setting for an Afropunk game. It's a world. It's a dive into pre-colonial Africa for rich lore you've never heard of before. It's an exploration into a world where most of the faces are dark, yet aren't considered to be one corner of the globe. It's a world where women hold power equal to men, and the merit of one's soul is what propels them through life. It's a world where spirits aren't to be feared. Instead, they are to be embraced. It's a time where we know that sorry, it's a time where we know that representation matters. This project is an effort to add that spirit to the way I know best. Narrative fiction in the nerdiest of flavors. Now, at this time, the RPG is just getting off the ground. What is out now is there's a quick start adventure out there, which you can find on Drive-Thru RPG. And there were some novels published through the Kickstarter that are available through Amazon. Now, the rules are due, I think it was by third quarter 2020, though depending on the state of the world with things going on right now, it would be very understandable if they were delayed. All right, well, that was Swords Fall by Brandon Dixon. All right, finally, I just want to say that I wish this list was longer. While doing research for this post, I saw a statistic from Omar Akil from uh, Board Game Brothers that stated, and this was a 2018 stat, that 12, only 12% 12 of all board games published are from black designers. And I got to say, I knew that number would be small, but I didn't think it'd be that low. Like, that's crazy. I personally would love to see this number grow substantially as the industry improves in the coming months and years. I look forward to a new wave of black game designers, which of course, I'm still probably gonna be buying a lot of money, uh, spending a lot of money on, on Kickstarters from Eric Lang. So, but I love to see the new blood out there. All right, well, that's it for our list of great games designed by black game designers. I'm gonna head over to that lobby and see if any of the awesome folk gathered there have any other games of their own to. So, uh, Danielle was commenting that uh, uh, Companion's Tale, fantastic yes. game. Oh, uh, good. Someone's play. I, it sounded really interesting. It sounded really neat. I like the change of perspective. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's interesting. I don't know if it's necessarily something I would 
yet. But again, I really want to listen to that one shot uh, episode right. that that plays it because it, it it was interesting enough that just reading through the blurb on Kickstarter mm-hmm. completely had me hooked. Yeah, it sounds like the kind of thing, kind of like Kingdom and Micro, Micro Scope, Microscope. Sorry, trying to blank yep, on the name. Yep. It sounds like that style of game with a little bit more to it, yep. which sounds awesome. Now, I do see Ryan was noting that he had no interest in the Warhammer setting, but loved Chaos in the Old World. So that's cool. That just goes to show how good a game it is. It's a fantastic yep. game. I, I know what I have on my pile of shame I need to do is I have the fifth player expansion where you play Skaven, but you need five players. Like you can't throw Skaven in unless you have five. Like you okay. have to have all the other gods for some, not Skaven, the Horde Rat specifically, but yes, yeah, Skaven. And they have another way to do it. And I was thinking about it as I was saying it. I, I think there is one game that came before it. From what I understand, Avalon Hills Dune, everyone has a different goal. So uh, Chaos and Old World wouldn't be the first game to do it because I'm at least some of the factions in Dune have different endings, but I think each of the five or six factions in Dune have a different ending. But it, uh, Chaos and Old World was the first one I saw that did that. It's, uh, yeah, so Ryan we'll... also pointed out that we've got the, the yeah. punk in 2020, but not the cyber, but there is someone who has stepped forward to offer cybernetic eyes to the multitude of media who were injured during protests recently, which I thought was one of the most cyberpunk things I've ever read. So uh, th- I think we got a bit of both going on. We're getting there. I actually saw a great uh, video the other day on YouTube and it was, it, it said something about, you know, cyberpunk is here now or, or some cybernetics are here now. And it was this video of this, um, woman doing some athletic stuff and i watched it three times before i noticed that she didn't actually have lower legs wow it was completely uh prosthetic (laughs) yeah and it was just sort of one of those wow (laughs) um so there's a or you see some of the 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 things they're now using for like bomb disposal or to get people out of hazardous situations where there could be rock slides or whatever. Some of the robots they've come up with. It's, I don't know. There's, there's some cyberpunk yeah. there too. We're getting, there definitely we're getting is. pretty, we're getting pretty cyber, but we are definitely in a pretty heavily punk ish yes. time. Right. Particularly yeah. now. Yeah. Right. Particularly <laughs> now. Yes. Um, yeah. The other thing we are definitely getting is the media manipulation and manipulation through, uh, largely funded groups i'll say instead of corporations because it's not just corporations yeah it's not just corporations but the corporations are definitely definitely there yeah they're definitely there i mean we yeah but that's good i i and and i do apologize if we missed a specific designer there obviously are other designers out there um i have played some of the games on the list i mainly went with board game geek or rpg geek ratings as well as just my usual search to see what people recommend if i didn't mention your game it's not due to trying to exclude you or saying your game is garbage absolutely and uh for better or worse i know some there are some concerns about it but uh you know there are a lot of lists like this getting generated right now because a lot of people aren't necessarily aware uh as they should be of the population of designers out there who uh, you know are black or people of colors or transgendered or gay or whatever you may be that's not you know, a cis white old male uh, um, out there uh, and to get that different experience because they can bring something to a game that we can't conceive of. Fair. All right. Uh, So finally, if you've got a... I thought you were going to do this part first. Oh, yeah. So that's it for our main (laughs) topic tonight. You're highlighting things and I'm... That's it for our main topic tonight. Remember, you can find lots of gaming topics and advice like this over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. Click on gaming advice at the top of the page. Uh, Finally, if you've got a game or game night question, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Up next, a look at Mermaid Adventures by Eloy LaSanta and Third Eye Games. All right, Murdered Adventures is a fantasy role-playing game that was originally kickstarted. It was uh, on a Kickstarter that funded and was published in 2012. So this isn't thought into the new hotness here. Now, since then, Aloy has released an updated version, uh, Mermaid Adventures Revised, which was based on his PIP System Core rulebook they put out, which is a generic universal role-playing system. Uh, this review, though, is on the original printing of the game, because that's one I own. Uh, I personally own, have played, and run the 2012 full-color soft cover edition. 
Now, of the printing I own, you can also get a black and white version and a PDF. Um, though at this point, I'm going to assume you're just going to pick up the revised edition. I would have to assume that unless Aloy has a bunch in his basement, there probably aren't even copies of the edition I have out there anymore. Uh, so indeed, the work to put into the revised copy seems more than worth it. Uh, not in any way to minimize the effort put into the first version, as we'll see. Yeah, fair enough. You know what? I should I should go buy the revised edition because I enjoyed this edition so much as to have it. Now, the one I'm talking about, again, this is only talking about the first printing, the first edition, full color. Uh, it's literally exactly 100 pages long. I don't know. Something about that just made me feel good. Some little part of my brain's like, even number. Um, full color, single column, uh, very large and easy to read font, which I got to admit is awesome for my old eyes. Uh, and it features a ton of awesome artwork from Melissa Gay. There is a very well-produced book, uh, just really nice, um, great layout, visually appealing, lots of white space, uh, easy to read. Like it just, it flows. Like it just, you're going to sit down, start reading this book and finish it. You're, you're not going to put it down and go do something else. The rules are simple, concise, and easy to understand. And one of the best parts is it's written at a level even kids could read and learn to play just from this book. Now, this is a traditional role-playing game, and what I mean by traditional is you have a GM and players. Uh, the GM is called the Navigator in this particular game. Uh, the Navigator is going to run the game, drive, and moderate the story, while the other people are going to play characters in that story. Now, the characters are all merfolk of various types. Now, it's not just your fish, not your standard mer person you're used to seeing, your merfolk. You got your fish folk, but you also have eel folk, urchin folk, jelly folk, octo folk, ray folk, shark folk, and lobster folk. Uh, along with this is a very generic underwater setting. Uh, they've got a, the capital city of Atlantis, as well as a nearby dark lands. Uh, along with that is a small assortment of non-merfolk sea creatures, including the dreaded Kraken. Well, I mean, I guess if you need to have an opposition force of some sort, though I kind of want the Kraken to be misunderstood. Oh, and you could totally run that in this game. The, the the convert the Kraken, find out, you know, the thorn in its paw or in its tentacle and remove it and have a happy Kraken would totally fit this game. Now, character creation is dead simple. Uh, you pick a type of merfolk that you want to play. Um, it gives you starting statistics, which are based on four different things. You've got body, mind, charm, and luck. You get a little couple points that you get to customize it so everyone's a little unique. You pick some starting qualities. Now, qualities are kind of a mix of skills in another game, as well as special abilities. So, like, your quality could be that you're a gymnast and you're really good at gymnastics, but it could also be that you can cast spells. Uh, it's all covered under the same thing. Uh, there's also a series of charts that I personally loved. These are for determining all kinds of random things. Uh, we were talking about cyberpunk earlier in the show today, and it reminds me of the old life path systems in there where you roll up things like what you look like and what color your hair is and how many siblings you have, unique items you carry, preferred weapons, clothing style, and all kinds of stuff like that. Now, there's also a spot on the character sheet to draw your character, which is something my girls thought was amazing. And if you head to the blog post version of this review, you can actually see the pictures my girls drew for their most recent characters. Yeah, honestly, while I can't draw a decent stick figure without a suite of software, I have always enjoyed the act of working out your character's look, either descript descriptively or visually. Now, the mechanics are dead simple. Uh, all you need is some D6 dice, standard sets of dice. Um, the game recommends white and black. Uh, you do need two colors, though I guess technically, like if you can remember, like you could technically just roll the same die multiple times or whatever, but it's definitely easiest if you have two different colors of dice. Now, anytime a task comes up that there's an uncertain outcome, you're going to make a task roll. You're going to build a pool of, I'm going to say white and black dice as if those are the colors you have, but whatever dice colors you want. You're going to grab white dice being good dice. You're going to grab as many of the white dice um, based on your attributes and qualities you have, which is really simple. You just look, if you have a three in body and you're trying to do something physical, you use that. And then if you have any applicable skills, you get bonus dice. Applicable items, you get bonus dice. Then you're going to pair them with the other colored die based on the difficulty of the task set by the navigator. So this is your difficulty. So the more dice in there, the harder it is to do something. Now, all the dice are rolled in one big pool. All that you're looking for is four, fives, and sixes. Those are hits or successes, whatever you want to call them. And what you're going to do is you're going to make a pool and go, how many white successes and how many other color successes did I get? If you have more white successes, you succeed. If there are more of the other color, the task fails. 
And interestingly, a tie results in a partial success using the improv yes, but system. So yes, you did that, but something else happened because you got a tie. So not a simplistic, but still a simple system. Uh, the maths there are far from simple averages when you start taking color into account, but it's not hard for anyone to. Yeah, as a DM, I wouldn't know if you had a 33 to 180% chance to succeed in anything in this game. But you know what? The basics of grab as many dice as your stats say with the bonuses for your stuff. And I'm going to say it's a three difficulty. And there's, of course, a little chart that says, you know, easy, difficult, hard, and how many dice to throw at it. Now, there is also a more detailed conflict system. Now, this, by conflict, I don't necessarily mean fights. Uh, this can be used for social interactions, uh, race, um, uh any character versus character interaction where two people are competing over something or about something. Now this involves opposed roles. So you're going to build your dice pool. I'm going to build my dice pool. Sean's going to build his dice pool or the navigator will build the dice pool and you're going to roll and count your hits. Now the differences in your hits cause damage to your opponent's attributes. Now, like if you were having a social interaction where you're trying to insult someone, you could be damaging their mind stats. So just to show that it's not necessarily just fighting. Um, now, there is, to go with this, I, a, a bestiary of sorts, though that sounds more adversarial than I want, but there's a small list of friends and enemies and then the statistics for those. So when you do want to have a conflict against an undersea pirate, there's the stats for it. Now, along with all this, Aloy's game includes a ton of great generic gaming advice like stuff like how to be a navigator how to be the dm even stuff like getting your group together and inviting people over and it's very much aimed at someone who's never played a tabletop game a role-playing game specifically and does a great job of onboarding and even better it does this in a very kid-friendly language and tone which there just isn't enough while sure, many people of gaming interest can jump into something more complex right off the bat, there's no reason at all not to have a full entry level or gateway games for RPG mm. the way hobby games, board games have. So, so often, perhaps more so in the past than now, difficulty in an RPG was almost a badge of honor for games. Yeah, yeah and I, I'm not saying that's something that should necessarily be eliminated, but it is nice to have accessible, easy to get into games that make the hobby more inviting to new players. Now, the final thing you will find in the Mermaid Adventure books is a series of short adventures. I think there's only three of them. I'd have to grab my book to check, but these are to give you a taste of what types of stories the navigator can tell and how to implement the rules. It gives you some good examples of what type of die rolls and which um, difficulties to use. And what I like the most about this is the variety of, the, of them because they weren't all beat up the bad guys. Um, for example, the second adventure is the characters take part in the underwater Olympics. And there's a bunch of different events testing their different skills. And the character who wins the most of them is gets the gold medal and gets to be the, the leader, like the, the winner, right? Like gold, silver, bronze, you get first, second, third. Which I just thought, like, there's no adversary there, right? There's, there's none of that conflict you often see. Yeah, it's a great thing to see when, as a society, we're finally beginning to some to question some of the acts of violence we see, even from people considered as heroes of some sort by some. Mm. Uh, while a good story requires conflict, conflict doesn't mean violence. Very true, and we are seeing more and more of that, at least in, in especially the indie gaming scene. Now, overall, I think Mermaid Adventures is a, a awesome introduction to role-playing games for families and young children but i also have to say i think there this game would work for a full a group of full-grown adults and they're gonna have fun with this system like i could see grabbing my monday night group and running a one shot with this and having a great time now what i was even more impressed with besides my feelings on the game and how well it worked with our family was when my oldest who was I think eight at the time, asked to read the book herself after playing and was able to take the book upstairs, devour it in an afternoon, and then come downstairs and run it for her sister, which was awesome. Without me interacting, like I, I watched over their shoulders, but they were able to pick it up and do it for the first time. So like basically on our third RPG session, my oldest daughter was DMing her first game because of the, the ability to onboard with this such a simple system. Yeah, and as with so many games, the difference between an, a 
adult group of role playing adventure and a family group is really about the depth and complexity of the storyline mm -hmm. so much more than a lot of the system itself. Very true. Now, both my kids love Mermaid Adventures. Uh, this was a fantastic introduction to the to the world of prescripted imaginary play, right? Versus their, their usual running around pretending they're princesses or ponies or spacemen or Jedi. Um, and the concept of using mechanics to determine which way a story goes, which I gotta admit, I'm, I'm glad my kids, I never heard the, I hit you, no, I didn't. It never seemed to happen because I, I kept waiting for that because if it did, I was going to grab a D6 and go in the other room and say, hey, why don't you use a D6? I never got to that point, but I thought this was a great introduction to this more structured play. I personally can't help but recommend this game to anyone interested in bringing their kids into the world of fantasy role-playing games. And I got to say, I think, like Sean said, about being a gateway game, I think this would even be a great game to just throw at people who've never role-played before at any age. Well, for a more in-depth look at Mermaid Adventures, head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews. And now, the Bell Hops Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tables? Every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. And we got a bit of the first two this time. There actually was an event happening. So, I got a couple things I want to cover. First up are the games we played, but I want to talk about... Renegade Gate Con Virtual. This was an online gaming convention that I actually took part in this last weekend. With the need for isolation not ending anytime in the future oh. and gatherings still restricted, Renegade Games did what many are now attempting, making that transition to digital platform. Not an insignificant act and challenge. No, I totally agree. But first off, I'm going to jump back to the physical games we played. Before I get to Renegade Con, we're going to wrap up with Renegade Con. Um, so last week, not last week, sorry, two weeks ago, our last show, I talked about in our look ahead how we need to sit down and play Black Box. This is probably the oldest game in my collection, or close to it. I probably still have a copy of Waterworks somewhere. Um, this is a, an older game, very unique and we played the physical copy, and this is just a brilliant game design. Uh, like, the, the physical presentation of the game is really nice. It's a nice plastic tray, plastic pieces. I think there are wooden balls that you put on it. Like, just beautiful. Uh, fairly well-designed rule book, though thick. Uh, Deanna and I played through a couple full games, where a full game is we each take a turn playing the, the, the clue setter and the clue guesser. I can't remember what they're called. Um, now, we did have to spend quite a bit of time going through the rule book going through all the examples that are like set up a ball here and if the ray comes in this way where's it go if a ray comes in this way where's it go all right set up these two balls and where's it go and having to go through it um that took some time and it took a, a while to learn how the rays specifically interact and it seems pretty simple until you get ones where they're curving all over the place now i gotta say that's the drawback to this game is is this is a learning curve this is a significant learning curve and i am certain that even people who played the game multiple times experienced players mess it up because that's actually part of the scoring of the game where if the clue giver gives the wrong answer the guesser gets a bonus it's it's that common to actually mess up the rules for these rays you know they expect some extreme play when the <laughs> rule book accommodates that fact in the scoring yes for the game now, is it an extreme play when it's actually accounted for in the game? Or is that just part of the game? <laughs> but it is, it is easy to make mistakes, I will say. Now, I gotta say, uh, once we got through that learning curve, not that the learning curve was like painful or anything, we had it was okay. But we had a lot of fun playing the game. But I gotta say, um, one of the things I'm always looking for, we mentioned this on previous shows, when it's Deanna and I playing a two-player game, is, is it a date night game for us? Is it something I throw in... Uh, a milk crate and it goes in our van and the next time we're driving out to kingsville i bring it with us and i gotta say i don't think this is one i want on my our date night list unless it's going to be an alcohol free date night because it's quite the brain burner uh this is not one that we want to be playing after you know going back up to our room and having a few drinks and like no this this is not gonna replace the duke or some some well, not that the duke's light but no this is this is a, a clear and sober sit at a coffee shop well caffeinated game which which would fit for some dates but not our usual date nights at least 
Uh, up next, we finished off our uh, technically second because we did one on um, with with uh, one of our patrons the other day. But we finished off a game of Clans of Caledonia on Board Game Arena. Uh, this is now two times I've gone through a full game. We're still playing a couple other games, and I gotta say I do dig the interface, except for the one complaint. The complaint I have about pretty much everything on Board Game Arena, and that is the lack of an undo button. Like there are a couple times where my math was off. And I really wanted to take back part of a move I was making, not even the full move. And in both times, it was in regards to placing beside an opponent's piece to get a discount. And once I figured out I made the mistake, I'm like, oh, I can't buy anything. All you can back out is on that buying. You can't then not place the piece and place it somewhere else. And that would have, like, I haven't even finished my turn. I, I'm like, I messed up. I don't have enough merchants is what I did once. Another time I was off by one coin, like doing the math in my head. I'm like, oh, I thought that'd be cheaper. And... Oh, it drove me nuts. Like, once you get to the buying part, you can't take back the placement. And that annoyed the heck out of me. Yeah, I have to say, I've been getting a bit frustrated by my uh, that myself of late. In, in a few games, uh, a few dumb clicks, not enough coffee in the morning when I come yeah. downstairs. And, you know, you see you know, all, the, uh, all the folks over on the left coast have played throughout the night. And you've got a bunch of turns to make. Uh, boom, you make a mistake. And yep. even if you have, even if it's not that next player's turn yet, you're locked in. Done. Yep. Yeah, Deanna made one where she passed accidentally. And I'm like, ooh. <laughs> like, yeah. In I, that I, game, ooh. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I haven't done anything that drastic in clans, but in a couple of the other games I've been in, it's just yeah. been like, why did I hit, why, why did I hit the, ah. Oh. Yeah, like, it, it, we, we, we I, got distracted by a kid. Yeah, there was there was one game where I think it was like my second turn of the game, um, and I, I'm pretty sure I'm done. Yeah, <laughs> you're like was, I, I I can't win. Yeah, you know, I'll, like I'll I said, I, you caught a thing. I admit it was annoying to have to say yes, I'm done my turn, but I would get used to that over time. Like that's Probably, just a memory yeah, thing. You, yeah, I I I'm tempted to go to Yukata to play everything. Just although I don't know if they even have clans, just for that stupid button. <laughs> All right. Next, back to the physical game table. I broke out my copy of 878 Vikings. I don't know if we put the... Is that one we have the unboxing out yet? I can't remember. I know I recorded I, one. I don't believe so, no. No? Okay, so that one's not out yet. So there'll, there'll be one. I was going to ask what's coming on Monday, but maybe that'll be it. Yeah, yeah, but it depends if we play again. I need to play it more. I'm not ready to review it at this point. But uh, this is... um. An Academy Games game, it's part of their Cube War game series uh, that includes 1812 Invasion of Canada and the other Birth of America series. Uh, this is the first game in the Birth of Europe series, um, except this isn't actually a Cube game because everyone called them their Cube War game series. But this one in particular was a Kickstarter and the Kickstarter had a stretch goal where they upgraded the cubes to minis. So not a Cube game anymore, but I'm going to call it a Cube game because everyone groups all those games together. Well, that's just not right. But alas, I'm sure the global <laughs> cube market is not overly distorted by such heresy. I will say, you know what? I, I didn't mention this in, in my notes, but I was actually really worried that the miniatures would fall over because they're tiny. And I thought I was going to hate them and I prefer the cubes. And like I said, the cubes are fine. I have There's no reason these have to be minis, but they weren't falling all over the place like I thought. So... That 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 was a surprise. So I wasn't as disappointed by having miniatures as I thought I'd be. And yes, I was disappointed having miniatures. Not everyone wants bits of plastic for everything. There's something elegant about the cube-based Euro game, especially on like a folk on a map game where it just it looks like you know you're a general standing over the 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 table there planning your strategies, right? Yeah. You're I don't think of it as individual units. Plus, like a cube to me could represent a thousand units, whereas one little miniature Viking looks like one guy. And I, for some reason, stretching that to mean 100 guys doesn't work as well. But anyway, on to the game. Um, at this point, I'm going to need way more plays before I'm ready for final thoughts. But I will say I liked how unique this felt compared to the other games in the series, plus how familiar it felt by being one of the games in the series. And I realize that's slightly contradictory, but it uses the exact same card-driven movement, the exact same combat system with even the same results on the dice of a flee, a command, a kill, or nothing. Um, that's in all of the rest of the games in the series, but then throws in some new stuff like leaders that are traveling with hordes of troops and cities being able to bring up the peasantry to defend them on the English side. And it did a really good job, I thought, of capturing historic elements of the time period, uh, especially in the way the English mostly are defending 
and then they lose a few towns and then they counterattack to get them back. Whereas the Vikings just get wave after wave of new heathen hordes coming in every round. And that just, it did a great job of getting that feel of what actually happened in that time period. And at this point, all I'll say is I'm really impressed so far. Everyone is impressed by Vikings. They're great that way. Yes. <laughs> All right, up next, uh, Deanna and I got in our play of Fox in the Forest, kindly donated by friend of the show, Kevin, who must be working tonight because he's usually in our chat room. I feel bad because he's been asking me like every day, did you play it yet? Did you play it? Did you play it? And we finally played it. So I have played this game before. I had a borrowed copy um, that we played quite a few times, but this is my first time playing with our own copy. And you know what? It hasn't changed my mind. Not that I thought our copy would be different, but you know what? It's been a few weeks since we played. This is still one of the best two-player discoveries I've made this year. This is probably like at the end of the year, around New Year's, when we do a best new games to me in 2020, Fox in the Forest is easily going to be on this list. Uh, this is a fantastic game. You can see my full review over on the blog or uh, check out one of our previous podcasts. That's the six-pack Great Board Games for Six Players, episode 88. You know what we have to do is try to tie the reviews better into the topics because that is not a six-player game. You're we did not. it tonight. Tonight we're good. Tonight it worked, but I think we I, I might need to do more work on that because going to find a Fox in the Forest review on an episode about six packs would just seem weird. Hey, Light Cold, if you could stick around to the after show, we may talk about that. We probably will. It's it's yes. accelerating quickly. Uh, which we'll get to soon. Yep. All right. Finally. The last game we played this past week was a few more rounds of Codenames Duet. Uh, again, we stuck with the basic rules. We still haven't figured out that map thing. I just got to sit down and read the rules, and I hadn't done it yet. Um, I'm still digging this one more than I thought I would, but we found that this game this time, I don't know why, why it didn't seem to happen last time, maybe just luck, is it can switch between a ton of fun, like both of us laughing, too frustrating, somewhat frustrating, depending on what cards you have up and how well they link to each other. Like sometimes you get a set where you look down, and you're like, I can find five words that all have to deal with Vikings since we were just talking about Vikings. And that's actually a clue I used when we were playing one of the games. And that's fun where you're like, oh, wait, all of those words are Vikings and none of the assassins are even tied to it. And let's hope my partner can guess all of them. And when they get at least four of them, you're like, oh, that was awesome. That was a great clue. But then sometimes... You're sitting there and you're staring at it for five to 10 minutes and you can't even find a single two word clue for the life of you. And I got to say, that's not fun, especially when neither of you, because like even the start of the game is whoever can come up with a clue first just starts. We had at least one match where Deanna and I are just staring at it going, oh, I don't know. Like, I I don't know. <laughs> when you have to give a one word clue and code names, that just, you feel like you failed. So I don't know. I, like overall, most games seem to fall in the middle where you get a couple really good fours and fives and threes. And then your last few clues are ones and twos and it works. It's fun. Uh, when you get those fives and sixes, it's an amazing experience. You get a couple ones. It's fine. So most games are falling in the middle and that's good. Like, like it, it, it probably wouldn't be fun if all the words were associated with each other and it was too easy. Uh, overall, it's cool. Yeah. It's it, every game has its ups and downs. Uh, I think this game in some ways is a lot like the medium uh in whereas mm. you know sometimes people are going to connect to something and while you and d may look at something and stare at it for 10 minutes and have no clue uh you know bob and mary down the street could look at those exact same yep. words and have six different clues so it, it it's just one of those things you know so many life experience and and education mm. level and, and type of education opens and closes so many different things game just have to hope the good outweighs the uh the frustrations overall in your bounces out in your play yeah so far it has like i said I'm, I'm not shooting the game down at this point it just every now and then you might have that not so great play yep. now i also got to say that based on what you just said there's an advantage code names the normal game has is you're playing with teams it's not just two players trying to sync up so that is a slight advantage i think the full code names would have over duet though it's not designed to play two players. 
All right. So next, Renegade Con. Uh, technically, Renegade Con virtual. Renegade Con colon virtual. I, I, I couldn't figure out what exactly they wanted to tell you to call it, but that's what it was it, in their logos. It says Renegade Con virtual. Uh, this was an online gaming convention put on by Renegade Game Studios. Uh, this la ran last Friday to Sunday. Uh, included pretty much all the things you'd expect at a physical con. Uh, there was an online store, which you could go and shop, uh, that even had con-exclusive promos, um, which was pretty cool. There were multiple game tournaments, including a huge, like, worldwide um, Raiders of the North Sea tournament with one of the sweetest-looking trophies I've ever seen. There were demo rooms. Uh, there were interviews you could watch. You could attend workshops, which, uh, interesting enough, like, had a list of what tools you would need to bring for the workshops. There were panels. And there was, like, even a lobby where you could just, like, hang out and chat and hang out with other people on uh, uh, talking Renegade games. Well, a, small, a tall task to take on, and one more and more organizations are being forced to learn without the kind of technical support and infrastructure something like this would have had available to it in the past. I got to say, this is not something I could have seen working five years ago. It would have been rough. Though I know there have been online cons. This is by far not the first online con. AetherCon, I think, has been around for 10 years. So it's not the first thing. Google Hangouts used to be a big part of it. Now, for this... Uh, Discord was was the the hub. I, I would consider it the, the hall. The main hall was Discord. That's where all the gathering was, the lobby. Uh, discussions on various Renegade games. They each had their own little chat room. Uh, there were also waiting rooms for the various demos there. Now, the demos themselves all used Tabletopia, which was a sponsor for the event. Uh, I guess Renegade and Tabletopia really worked closely together to get these games up on Tabletopia. Um, and what's interesting is they're gone now. They were up literally on Tabletopia for this con only, and they will be back for future online cons that Renegade's taking part in. So they had demos of Warp's Edge, Succulent, Space Battle Lunchtime, and Search for Planet X. And I would love to tell you about those, but I have to admit, I did not actually take part in any demos myself. As we've said, Tabletopia can be a, a bit of a resource hog for older or slower computers, but when you can see it, it is a really great way to display it. Yeah. Now, along with the demos, uh, there were various timed RPG events. I mean, like, they had time slots, like, at a normal con. Uh, these also used Discord for the waiting rooms and the chat, but they used Roll20 for the actual gameplay, the actual maps, character sheets, and stuff like that. Uh, games on offer included Altered Carbon, Icarus, Kids on Bikes, Junior Braves, Outbreak Undead, Overlight, Teams in Space, Wardlings, and the very hot and popular and just announced Kids on Brooms, a, a new evolution of Kids on Bikes, uh, obviously bringing into mind a certain wizarding world. Well, I did sit in on part of a session, a session of Altered Carbon. I didn't actually play in any of these games. I have to say, just the fact that you can sit in on sessions of games, really nice, to be honest. Uh, it's a great way to get a feel for a game uh, without maybe being uncomfortable sitting down with a, you know, a, a, a random group of people. But you know, it's always great at these cons if you can get to experience something uh, and a new game that you might want to bring back to your group uh, without necessarily, you know, sitting in and getting the full player involvement. One tech tip or one tip that I made the mistake of is mute your mic before joining a game in progress. <laughs> I learned that one. I got I got a lot of shouts at, at me and I, I had to apologize for that one. I didn't even realize it because my mic was just literally like sitting off in the corner of the room. But in Discord, when you join a voice room, it automatically turns on your mic. So mute your mic before joining a game. So I got to admit, it, I, I didn't play games at this con, but I did kind of check out the tech and what they're doing. But what I did do is I joined in on a variety of uh, workshops, panels, and interviews. So one of the things they did that I actually thought was kind of brilliant is they split up the types of content on different online platforms. So like all of the workshops were on Twitch. So if you went to Renegade's Twitch, actually they had a specific, yeah, Renegade's Twitch. It was just play Renegade's Twitch. And that was all your workshops. All the panels were on YouTube under a specific channel they created just for the con called Renegade Con. Uh, and then the interviews were, I guess, on Facebook Live, though you could also see them on YouTube. So I think they just did the, like the sharing thing. Uh, now, what I didn't like is that many of these overlapped. 
Now, that did very much give me that feel of being at a con going, well, I want to go to this panel, but this interview is at the same time. So I definitely had that problem. Um, it just kind of bugged me because I would be sitting there, uh, saying, sitting on a panel, listening to Banana Chan talk about world building and big adventures. And all of a sudden, a notice would pop up saying, the panel on Gaming With Your Kids is starting now. And I'm like, but, but Banana Chan's talking. So I tried to do the two monitor thing and keep both on at once. And no, I'm not Sean. I know Sean has like multiple audio going on. I, I, that didn't work for me. I unfortunately, I couldn't listen to two different live streams at once. I wasn't capable. Now, on a positive note, all of these, every single interview, panel, and workshop is going to be released on video on demand. So I will eventually get to catch up on what I missed. Con FOMO is real, even at a digital con. Like, I, part of me was like, come on, you guys run the con, just to stagger them. But I think they just wanted to get all the content in, right? There just weren't enough hours in the day to get everything in. But I was like, oh, come on, you're all renegade. Like, can't you just, like, push everything by half an hour? It was a little, a little frustrating, but like I said, you know what? It felt like a con. The fact I'm going to be able to go and watch all this later is great, right? Like, I, I won't have actually missed anything. So this is what I actually did. I, I spent the weekend working. This is what I do. I sit at this computer and work most of the time. So I sat at the computer working, and while I was working, I have two monitors, and I had one monitor over here with Twitch, and I had one tab over here with YouTube, and I would swap them depending on what I wanted to watch and one would be muted and the other wouldn't. And that's literally what I did is I always had one of the two going, which was kind of cool. And there was almost no time where there was nothing happening. So because of this, I attended a ton of like panels and workshops over the weekend. Yeah. And unfortunately, because it was just an online con, I was unable to get away and really take the time to participate this way uh, this weekend, the way I might, if I actually went to a con and yeah. you know, left and didn't have laundry and kids and, and all the associated mm -hmm. distractions uh, that, uh, that, that come from working at home. Yeah, there were, there were definitely things like there was, I forget what it was, but I'm like, I want to be back by five, four X. And I didn't get back by five. Like I, I'm at home. I got busy doing other things. Yep. Um, now what I will say is I was very impressed by the quality. Now, I mean both the quality of the the look and the feel, the technical side of things, like the the way they presented things, the, the the graphics, the transitions, the presentation was excellent, but even more so the quality of the topic and speakers. Like this was an amazingly diverse and talented group of people that were at this convention taking part. Like some of the biggest names in the hobby were there. Now, I don't have the time, or you don't have the time. I don't want to make this a four-hour episode. Usually our con wrap-ups are a full episode, and I probably could have. Uh, I'm not going to go through everything here, but just this is some of the highlights of what I attended. Now, one of the best and most enjoyable to watch, and this is one like watch for it when Renegade puts this out on video on demand, is the concept to cardboard. Uh, this was a panel. It was moderated by Mandy Hutchinson, uh, featured Quan Chai Moria, The Miko, Eric Hibbler, and Anita Osborne, and they were talking about creating art and board games. And I got to say what shocked me is two of the big names on that panel don't play board games at all, uh, like at all. Uh, the Miko in particular doesn't play board games and was talking about how they now have one of the largest board game collections in the place where he lives, which I'm sorry, I didn't note that down. And he was showing off the games and it's because it's all the production copies he gets for being the artist on them. And they were all in shrink. Like he just doesn't play board games. I just... Would have, I don't know, like in my head, I was just like, well, if you draw art for board games, obviously play board games. The other thing, though, is Miko is amazingly hilarious. Like if you if if, if you ever hear Miko is going to be on a podcast or he's going to be on a live show, just check it out just to listen to this man. He is hilarious. Yeah, I have to say this didn't actually surprise me as much as it seemed yeah. to surprise you. Personally, I don't see any problem with an artist filling their portfolio with things they don't take part in. Uh, as long as what this what this really actually says, though, is the importance of a detailed spec when yeah. you are creating a game. If you are able to adequately describe your needs to an artist, they don't need to know what the board, how to play the board game. They just need to make sure that their art, which you obviously like if you're giving mm -hmm. them the spec, uh, you know, fits exactly what your requirements are. And you're good. 
No, I was. I didn't have a problem with it. I don't. I don't mean it that way. It just oh, no. seemed. I, I don't. Just surprised me. <laughs> like I just assumed that like the person would be like, look at this is my like. I, I have to assume there's Magic the Gathering artists out there that never played Magic the Gathering, and it just. I don't know. My brain never put that together. Right. It makes sense. It yep. makes total sense. So another panel, and uh, I bring this one up for a unique reason because I don't actually own the game that it was about, and this was the Power Rangers um, Defense of the Grid. I think it's called something the grid i apologize for not having the full name here but it was a power rangers panel that talked about what went into making this game and importantly what goes into making a game series because this was meant to be bigger than just one game defenders of the grid thank you ryan in the chat room power rangers defenders of the grid and this was fascinating like they had a lot of big names in here this was hosted by terry latorco uh featured jonathan yang who's the lead developer on the game dan bojanowski who is a uh, behind the scenes um uh, the the spreadsheet guy, right? The guy in the back that does all the math. He was pointing out things like every time they'd want to change the size of the miniature, they'd have to go to Dan, and Dan would have to let them know if it's possible in the current box size, and if it wasn't, how that would impact their cost. And then uh, Jan Torres, who was the the graphic designer for all of Renegade, she is in charge of the entire graphic design of all of Renegade's games. And her a lot of her talk was about the unified look and things they did to make it like she had to redesign the lightning bolt for Power Rangers, right? Like they. Like, it has to have a lightning bolt because Power Rangers needs a lightning bolt. What's the Renegade lightning bolt look like? Like, this was just, there was a huge amount of sausage making. And it was totally fascinating. And I don't own the game. Like, I just happened to put that one on. And I'm like, that was a fantastic panel. Yeah, and uh, it's actually uh, Heroes of the Grid, apparently, is the 2019 Heroes. version. Okay. The grid apparently comes up a lot in Power Rangers. I'm not I'm, a real Power Rangers yeah. person, but if you search Power Rangers grid, like 15 different titles of shows okay, and, and, and fan fandom and things show up. So apparently the grid is part of... There you uh, go. Power Rangers I, Heroes of the Grid? Heroes of the Grid, yeah. There we go. Okay. So uh, it's intriguing how big Power Rangers is again right now uh, because uh -oh. it seems to have made another resurgence, even though the movie was three years ago. Um, it's, 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 it still keeps coming back. And I, I don't, I don't know. It, maybe it's just the whole thing. Like we had when we were kids, we had it. And now the people who had it are now adults with, with disposable income yeah, right. and are getting back into it. I don't know. I, I, I have a friend, my friend, Mike is a huge power Rangers fan. He, I'm, I, I don't, I doubt he knows this even exists. Cause while Mike does play board games, he usually learns them about them from me. So Mike is a huge fan. I got to admit by the time this panel finished, I wanted to buy the game. Like I'm like, Oh, this looks awesome. It's it's an eight two on BG. That it looks good. It, it I gotta admit it looks good. I and like I said, like hearing the sausage making made me want it even more. Uh, another one I attended, just an interview. I I watched an interview with Jonathan Gilmore. That was pretty cool. Um, mainly talking about his RPG side, and I didn't even know Jonathan Gilmore did RPGs. So like he's he's the man behind Kids on Bikes. I know him from it's not Renegade, so I think they didn't want to bring it up. But I know him from some of his work on um, Dinosaur Island, for example, or board games. Uh, I checked out a panel about designing unique RPGs. That was really good. Like just talking about doing something different. Uh, it was moderated by Victoria Rogers. Uh, fe featured Spencer Starkey, Doug Lebendowski, uh, Cleo Yun Sun Davis, and Christopher De La Rosa. Um, that one was really good. Like just fantastic panels. Like the the diversity in the group and the di diversity of views was fantastic. But overall, the best panel I attended for for my own personal sake that that I not even necessarily enjoyed the most, but found the most information on was uh, behind the scenes of game development. Uh, this was hosted by Sarah Erickson, featured Dan Bojanowski, Matt Riddle, Ben Pinchback, Paul Denon, and Shem Phillips. And what I liked about this is it was a lot of talk about the difference between design and development and how those are two separate things. And the thing it taught me that was important to me was I always assumed if you want to be a game developer, now a game developer is someone who iterates, who fixes the rules, who streamlines, who who almost a game editor in a way, but through mechanics, through play testing. I always assumed you had to be a designer to become a developer. Like I just assumed you would have had to have designed a game at some point to be able to prove your worth as a developer. And sure enough, Dan has never designed a game and has no interest to. He likes to, other people give him the, here it is, it's half built. 
fix it, finish it, right? Like he gets the half built Lego and finishes off the castle, right? And I just thought that was fascinating. Like just a, a great, again, what was really nice is seeing Renegade's side and how it changes where sometimes a designer will go to them and hand over a game and it's done. And then Renegade develops it and produces it and everything else. And the designer hands it off. And sometimes it becomes almost a totally different game. Uh, interestingly enough, oh, I forget the name of it. And it was one of the ones that were demos. Uh, the one about astronomy from Renegade, I'm totally forgetting the name, uh, was originally a game about lighthouses. And the lighthouses of northern Michigan, to be honest. Um, and they completely changed it. But that was one where the developers worked with... Um, I don't know, was Matt and and Ben? Is that Stellar you're talking about? Yes, yeah, Stellar. Yes, yeah, Stellar was originally about lighthouses. Um, I think it was Matt and Ben. Um, worked with them all the way through. Like yeah. obviously Matt and Matt ben and Ben are the design- Matt and Ben are the designers. Yeah, they're the designers of it. Um, they are the people. The 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 game I love by them is Fleet. And which again has lighthouses, so I think they just they they're, they like the upper the upper the upper peninsula of uh, camping up north in Michigan, and the red and white striped lighthouses are obviously a thing for them because there's some involved in fleet, but they were directly involved with every step of it, including the development. And I guess there was very little development, but that depends on how much of a finished product was handed over. But anyway, I'm kind of going on about this more than I planned to. But that one was really cool. Like, I, I dig that. If I could get a job in the board game industry that's not just content creating and reviewing, I think development would be awesome. Playtesting and development really interests me. And it was cool to see the, the different ways you can get into that. And there were more. Like, this is just like a handful. Like I said, I couldn't even tell you how many I attended. I think there were 12 different panels and eight different workshops. Excuse me. I think there were 12 different panels, eight different workshops. Right now at renegade.com is a good summary of everything they did. So, Yeah, it's great to see that the industry hasn't just thrown their hands up and said, well, what are we supposed to do? There's a pandemic. Uh, Instead, they've stepped up and made the cons happen. Now, it's different. And while a lot of people will say, oh, but there have been online cons for ages and ages, I think we're seeing a real evolution. Yes. Uh, the, the variety of solutions all being brought together. Um, and so you've got this coordination. Whereas you, in the past, you know, if you wanted to go to a Renegade Con, you'd go to renegadecon.com and everything would be there. You'd, you'd be there. Uh, in this day and age, that's not a feasible solution. Yeah. So you're seeing, you know, Roll20 and Tabletopia and Twitch and YouTube mm-hmm. and Facebook and everyone coming together and all these different solutions being brought to fo- focus, you know, and, and whether Discord is their hub or whatever they choose, um, they're distributing the processing because you can't have that quantity of content on one website right now Mm -hmm. Uh, the infrastructure doesn't work uh and so the distribution a fantastic way to make these cons really stand out now i gotta say when i first heard about this online convention and other online gaming conventions especially the the plethora of them the of them that have been announced this year because of of covid and not meeting in person i was skeptical like like really skeptical like almost enough that i didn't even bother checking them out like i i didn't think that it was going to work really to be honest like yeah you can go online and play games like i do it i play on board game arena all the time we play on yukata that's what i pictured was why would I go to an online con to do that when I can play with Sean and Deanna whenever I want? Like, I just didn't, I didn't grasp how much a virtual con could feel like. And I got to say, I'm very happy to say that Renegade Con proved me wrong on this completely. Like, I, it felt, I'm not like I was at a con, but like, I felt like I was attending an event. It felt like something special. It felt like something I couldn't do every day. Uh, I got to check out games that I didn't normally get to see. I admit I didn't play any. That, that maybe that's on my next list for the next one I attend. Um, I got to hit up panels. Um, I, I looked at promos, though. I got to admit this is something I hadn't mentioned yet. One one fault of Renegade Con is the online store was U.S. only. Now, I got to admit that's because of current shipping problems. So I can't really blame Renegade on that, but that part sucked. The dealer hall was like, hey, here's all this stuff you can't have. That kind of sucked. But you know what? Eh, uh, that's all right. I, I think it was neat. And then one thing happened 
the, the like the first time it happened a couple times, but like the first time this happened, this kind of cinched it for me, right? This is when it switched to feel like a real con. I am sitting in a chat room, Banana Chan's there talking about uh, world building, and I see a name pop up that I recognize. And then I made a comment, and that person's like, hey, Mo, and I'm like, hey, Nate, and we start chatting. I'm like, wait a minute, like here I am on a virtual con, and I just bumped into an old friend, like someone I know only from online. And then later, there was someone I ran into in Origins that I met at Origins last year for the first time ever. We bumped into each other in the chat room on Discord. And I'm like, my God, I ran into con friends at an online con. Like that just, uh, it, said, it, it flipped the switch. I'm like, all right, now it feels like a con. I'm like, I'm meeting up with old friends, but digitally. And I thought that was really cool. Yeah, after, it, it's quite interesting. I've actually been doing, uh, uh, one of the companies uh, I work with in my day job does uh, a lot of interesting um, uh, training training things now online uh, in this you know age of pandemics uh, and it's really interesting looking into the Q and A session of these live panels uh, and seeing people that I don't actually get to actually see anymore. Uh, and I got a phone call today, and someone was like saying, "Oh, hey, I saw your great comment the other day that everyone was yeah. was responding to on your thing," uh, and it's very much the same sort of sort of thing of, of meeting things. Um, so that's, that's fantastic. Uh, now we don't know what's happening in the future for online cons. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> I don't know. Right, right now though, I, like what this meant to me is I am looking forward to taking part in other online conventions. I'm not going to discredit them. There's no, no longer in my head is like, Oh, they're just doing an online con. I don't want to attend that. No, it's not going to be. A real con. It's not going to hold a candle to it. I, I'm going to really miss getting away from the house, right? Like, part of the things I love about cons is it's also a vacation. I get out of Windsor, I get to try new food, and I get to go out for drinks with some friends and people I haven't seen in years. We're not going to quite get that, but I am really looking forward to, to sitting on more panels on Twitch and sitting in on YouTube and taking part in a chat room and attending a painting workshop where they tell me what tools to have and have them in front of me so I can play along and do it at the same time. Like, that's really cool. And what I'd really like to try, the, whatever the next online con I attend is, is to actually play some games, which is the one thing I admit I did skip this time. I didn't get into playing the games. That required more scheduling right i didn't schedule myself this was i was working and i had a couple windows open next time i'm gonna have to make some time to actually play some games yeah and for me and again this is you know comes back to what i talked about earlier i really feel like um see now having heard your experiences and and learning from that uh you need you still need to schedule them right yeah if, if we're going to break out con i am gonna go into my calendar and i'm gonna block out three or four days and yeah and, and, and plan that, you know, oh, I can't do this, that, and the other thing because I'm going to be doing Breakout Con. And I think that needs to be taken into account for these as well because there yeah. really is just that much content. It's not like, oh, I'm just going to be playing a game on BGA. No, no, you're going to sit down at a virtual table with a bunch of people for mm -hmm. X hours or sit through four hours of, you know, talks and, uh, and on Twitch. Uh, mm -hmm. the scheduling needs to be there to make it work uh, efficiently. I agree. Now, just, just for everyone out there listening, uh, just let my experience be a learning experience, right? Don't discredit these online game conventions. Don't give up. And don't think that they can't feel like an actual con. Take the time to check them out and actually take part. They're never going to replace the real thing, right? But it is surprising how much of an actual con experience you can have at a virtual gaming con. All right. So how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? All right. So I have got a package that showed up. So that means I need to do an unboxing video. So I'm going to try to fit that in. I also have uh, that escape mail envelope, which we haven't decided what to do with. I think I'm going to do both at once. So we'll do this one official and then we'll do this one. Um, for those of you who are going to join in, I'm going to give a fair warning. There may be spoilers doing this one. I have no idea. So we're going to do it live with lots of spoiler warnings. And then maybe we won't put that up on YouTube, depending on what's in this envelope. We'll see how it goes. So I got to unbox those two things. So that we need to do. Um, for those of you here live, feel free to stick around after the show and I'll at least open up the box. You can see what's in here. Um, as for gaming, I want to get um, the other bicycle game done and uh, the wave two of bicycle games we we're talking about the exchange i am hoping to get in some plays with that 
Um, plus, the restrictions are being weakened here in Ontario, uh, not in Sean in my area as much as some other parts of the province, but enough that we are now allowed to uh, kind of pair up, right? We can have gatherings of 10 or more people. So for the first time since February, my mother-in-law is going to be taking the kids Friday. So Deanna and I are probably going to do some late night gaming that won't involve black box if you know what i mean <laughs> so look for some two-player games in next week's bellhops tabletop all right now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our vip guests our patreon backers we greatly appreciate their support timothy smith thanks timothy jeff seuss thanks jeff p.s goujon thank you william fisher thank you Danielle Thomas, thank you for almost always being in our chat room. It's awesome to see you week after week. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Well, the doors to the lobby are closed. You can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our, bell, our, drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com. More gaming content. I feel like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at our Patreon, patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast in your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. And be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.